Uh, hello and welcome to this audio commentary for The Wicker Man. I'm Mark Kermode. I'm going to be uh, moderating the discussion. And guys, do you want to introduce yourselves, please? Edward Woodward. I played Sergeant Howie. Christopher Lee, and I play Lord Summerisle. Robin Hardy, and I directed the film. Now, let's start with a bit of background. Uh, Christopher, can you tell us something about the uh, origins of the project? We, we know that uh, this novel, Ritual, was optioned, but it apparently has no role to play in the film that we're getting to see. So where did the Wicker Man story actually come from? I think I'm not the right person to answer that question. I think you'd have to ask Robin. Robin? Because all I know was that at one point, after meeting with... Robin and Tony Schaeffer a very long time ago, mm -hmm. it's 30 years ago now. Um, I did in fact speak to Tony, who said he was writing a screenplay as a result of our discussions. I can't quite remember what they were about. Although the question of the book Ritual did enter into it, there is no relationship at all between The Wicker Man and the book Ritual. And I rang Tony Schaeffer when he was in New York, and he said, uh, by the way, I've finished the script that we were talking about, the subject we've been discussing, and it's called The Wicker Man. I said, oh, well, then it's got something to do with the Druids. And he said, I hate you. And that was why that started. <laughs> well, you weren't calling him a Druid, were you? No, but, I mean, The Wicker Man is about the sacrifices of the Druids, hmm. basically. Well, do you want me to say what the origins were? Yes, please. Um, the origins were an interest on the part of um, Tony Schaffer and I in horror films generally. And we were great fans of the Hammer films. We used to cross town to go and see the latest one. Uh, but uh, we felt that they were very much um, uh, a series of films with a series of rules of how, um, you know, uh, the devil and witches and 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 things evil uh, were viewed by the church, and we thought it'd be interesting because many of those things were uh, hangovers from our pagan religion of you know, 15 or 16 centuries ago. It would be interesting to have a society in which um, everyone was a pagan. Can we just point out that that's you on screen holding the uh, holding forth in the church? Yes. Wonderfully reverent, I look. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, we, in effect, put one Christian person in amongst a pagan community. Um, and we thought that the puzzle for the audience, although the film is full of clues as to that fact, would be um, one of the rewards of the film. Now, it's just worth pointing out because we're on this opening sequence. The many versions of The Wicker Man exist. This is the longest existent version of the film. And these early sequences do not exist in ver various cuts of the film, including the restored American theatrical cut. Is that correct? I, no, the there theatrical isn't. cut? I don't think that's correct. Certainly the British video doesn't include any of these scenes. The American video always had had these scenes. The American video, but when you restored it for theatres in America, didn't you take these scenes out? To no, no, no. They, uh, we took them from a print, an original print. Mm -hmm. um, and these scenes were um, seen in the theatres in, in the United States as a result of our restoration of the film. I haven't seen... I, I, I can't remember ever having seen half of the stuff I've just been watching. Really? Uh, no. <coughs> ever. I can just remember there's bits of scenes that I have seen. I've never seen the church at all. Ever. You saw a little bit of the church, Edward, I think, which is the bit that is a, a, um, uh, a cutback later in the film where we see you taking mm. the sacrament. Oh, possibly, but none of these scenes. No. Yes, but no, I'm talking about, yes, I'm talking up front. Up front, no, no, no. I've never no, seen, no, I've never no, seen no, any no, of these. No, that's this, this scene, or this yeah. scene we're looking at now. No, no none matter. of that. I'm quite, it's no, quite no, true. no, no, that's true. But this the, with the taking of the, the sacrament DVD, we did yeah. see just um, later yes, on in yes. the film. Yeah. What I found about the about missing out the, the, the whole frontispiece, as it were, and just starting really with the, the, the aeroplane landing in the, in the loch, which is most of the ones that I've seen, by cutting all of that out, you, act, you don't really understand much about Howie. It takes you a long, long time to find out 
how how he ticks or why he ticks. Whereas in the f- and when you've got the front, you know straight away what kind of man he is. Of course, with the scenes in the church exactly. and everything. Oh, exactly. Yeah. That was always the sadness. Well, to it's me. one of the many tragedies <laughs> that happened to this film, about which I feel extremely strongly and about which I've spoken for many, many, many years. It's what's missing. And what was taken out and what's disappeared. The other and really, it's not just these scenes, but it's some of the stuff that I did with Edward when he first meets me. Magnificent, magnificent writing, wonderful lines, all removed, all gone. The other thing about this opening that is really important is the fact that the film is about sacrifice. And the, the mass, if you like, or the, um, the bread and the wine, uh, the blessed body and... Um, blood of Jesus Christ, uh, which we see actually celebrated in this opening sequence, has a very specific tie-in with the end of the film. Mm, absolutely. And, and if you miss that, admittedly, uh, the people who butchered the film did um, have a, um, a cutback of it very, very briefly late, yes. later, because otherwise the film would have made no sense. Um, but I miss it. I miss the church scene even more than this. Now, now we're getting close to what people usually see, although in point of fact, yeah, they, I think they it's after the seaplane takes off and the music starts. It's about now yes, it is, isn't it? that yes. the film version and the British video start. Now we're into the story. But again, you don't see all of these islands. Definitely not, but you have this wonderful song that's going over all this, which is superb. I thought the music oh. uh, was was oh. some of the best music I've ever heard. Definitely. What, what, what was so great? What is so great about the music is it fits the movie, it fits the film like a glove. It's absolutely, I think, astonishing. One of the interesting things is when the film was first reviewed in the United States, um, very few people mentioned the songs and the fact that it has 13 songs in it because as you say it fits so well that it's just a continuation of the dialogue yes. of the film um, but there are some 13 musical numbers some include <laughs> dancing <laughs> <laughs> no I never got round to dancing it, it, I don't remember. no you didn't but others did <laughs> oh, oh wait a minute I did a little traditional songs aren't they I mean some are traditional <laughs> they weren't all written by Paul Giovanni were they no um, a lot of the songs um, are based on uh, traditional um, Scottish airs, but with the words um, by Robbie Burns, Scottish national poet, um, in many cases um, edited by Peter Schaffer, not Tony Schaffer, but Peter Schaffer. Who, oh, really? I didn't who, know that. Yes, well, he and, he and Paul Giovanni were great friends, and he, they worked very closely together because, as you know, um, he really stayed behind with the film when Tony had to go to New York in the early part of the shooting. Oh, Peter did. Peter Shepard did. Yes, Peter was oh, with us. Oh, yes, they were both up there. I remember yeah. very well. Mm. In fact, I remember a remark that we will come to later that, uh, <laughs> that Peter made when I was sitting between the two of them and introduced me to Total Hysterics because it was so brilliantly witty. And it was to do with one of these old gods. And it would be very difficult for somebody to understand who's not perhaps even, you know, British. Uh... The one of the, the old loons. gods, was exactly. Uh, <laughs> Shoni, whoever Shoni was, obviously a Celtic god. And it was spelt, I think, L-E-W-S or something like that. But that was the name of the god. Shoni of the Loos. <laughs> Which being and, translated uh, is Shoni of the Lavatories. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> could be, in English, <laughs> yes. L-O-O-S. Yes. 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 You see, and Peter Schaffer, I, I looked at Peter and I said, that, that's a funny one. He was sitting opposite Tony. We were at dinner. You were at the other end of the table, Edward. I remember that very well. And uh, I said, you know, that's a, that's a, that could get a bit of a laugh there no, no, from an English audience who knows all about uh, what the word sounds like and what they could mean. And uh, Peter said, perhaps something a little more pastoral, like Shoney of the Bogs, <laughs> which is another <laughs> English word for a laboratory. <laughs> and I completely convulsed. And I have to say, so did Tony. Yes. Just on the subject of the songs, which you were talking about before, um, we interviewed Anthony Shafford just before he, he died, um, which is just recently, and he said that there was a Broadway play 
being planned based on his screenplay and on the songs by Paul Giovanni. Did any of you know anything about that, and what's your feeling about that? No. I didn't know. No. I know something about what's appeared on the Internet to the effect that Universal Films have stated quite specifically that they're going to remake The Wicker Man with Nick Nicolas Cage. Cage, and they want me in it. This has really bewildered me because obviously it would have to be an American story with an American subject and an American community. I, I wouldn't know how to uh, even imagine it. Awfully and what I would say... He's going to be in it, no, yes. but, but not me. No, yes. because and you're we, not going to we got rid it. of you. No. Yes, I, I was thinking ahead about the sequel. I thought, we can't have him in it. And <laughs> not no. playing the same role. Exactly. Obviously. Rather charred. <laughs> and uh, then they know. said, you know, and they wanted uh, me to be in it. And I thought, well, what on earth do I play? Maybe the wicker man standing there. <laughs> may, may I interject for a moment? Yes. There's these fishermen here. The two ones in front here were, were actors. Yes. All the rest are, are literally the local fishermen of Plockton, um, who actually did very well in this sequence. Well. You see them all passing, they were wonderful. passing the, the photograph around here, and they... Uh, they didn't look awkward, did they? No, they didn't. No, never seen before, or whatever it was. And they hadn't, yeah. of course, so that was no, all right. <laughs> Wonderful faces. Yeah. And, of course, they had the right accents, too. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Let's talk a little bit about the location. Where was all this shot? Where's the area that The Wicker Man is filmed in? Well, this was shot in Plockton, on the... Uh, above the Highlands, really, wasn't it? On, on Opposite the, uh, the Island of the Sky, right? Yes, yes it was, wasn't it? Over mm. the Sky, yeah. It was, it's a beautiful, beautiful oh. area. I went back there fairly recently, about two years ago. The people there were all we freeze. That's right. This uh, religion where um, Monday is a Sabbath because it's quite close to Sunday, and so is Saturday. The we free kirk. And they were tremendously helpful to us four days a week. But three days a week, <laughs> they'd pass us in the street and pretend we weren't there. Yes. Uh, they were absolutely charming like, people. Rather like being on a Soviet ship in Alaska, which I experienced. <laughs> they had their own they were all very, very yeah. cheerful with us when we were on board their <laughs> ship. But when we drove, uh, not drove, when we sailed into the harbour of Juneau, the capital of Alaska, and we then saw them in the streets, they watched straight past us without any form of recognition at all. The other thing it's worth pointing out is that obviously the story of Wicker Man is set just on the cusp of the beginning of summer, but what was the time of year that you were actually filming in this area? Well, we finished it at this time of year. God, it was cold. I have never been oh, so cold. November and December. In my life. We had ice in the mouths of the crowd, and yes. we had heaters under the close-ups. I should point out that putting ice in the mouth... Uh, Stops that her coming out yes, you know, of, 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 yeah. of the yeah, yeah, mouth. But it was it. Oh, I, that's why I, I was there. Yes, yeah. that, this was all being May done up. Um, and the shop was, was it? Yes, it was all beautiful. Being, the art direction on this piece oh, was, was superb, was and, yes. and of course the photography, of Harry Waxman. Was, but it was so cold. It was it was oh. unbelievably cold, and and I I, I, mean, I felt felt sorry for us. I was in a you know comparatively a thick uniform and. Chris was wearing a kilt most Not of the time. Until later. Which is pretty jolly well warm, that's true. But the girls, the women from the from the village, were in these light summer dresses. And I don't know how they survived. <laughs> and why did it end up being filmed in completely the wrong time of year? Because the film had to be made at a time uh, when the money was available and when, in order to avoid the trade union, complaining that Shepperton was about to be closed down because it had just been bought. This was in Slater-Walker time and uh, acid stripping. That A film had to be made to show that the, the studio was still active. And that wouldn't wait for seasons. It had to be done immediately um, before the union complained that uh, there was going to be acid stripping going on. So that, that, that was the reason it was made then. When would we start? October, was it? Yeah. So you had this astonishing sight... Uh, on the faces of the locals as they saw trucks driving through the streets of their villages laden with blossom. Yes. <laughs> Artificial blossom trees. trees yes. Superb. I never forget some of their faces when they saw this. And how were the locations originally found? Because the whole pre-production process was very fast. So how did you find 
the areas to film in? Well, we we had to stitch um, an island together, and it's very difficult to identify an island in a movie because you can't see it all at once. Uh, or so those aerial shots are very important. Mm -hmm. But um, we also had to stitch the um, the uh, architecture together, um, the stone village and the castle. Um, which part of which was Georgian and part of which was sort of Gothic. Mm -hmm. And so it actually took 25 different locations to make all those things meet without there being a council house built in 1920 just in between or something like that. And so uh, we travelled virtually every other day, the whole <laughs> convoy. We certainly did. The whole new series of hotels. It was a nightmare down those roads which only have <laughs> not two lanes but one lane. Um, and... Um, uh, it was a logistic triumph, really, for the production people that they got it all done uh, on schedule. I also, one of the astonishing things is that we hardly, we hardly, uh, if, uh, as far as I can remember, we did some pretty bad weather, didn't we? But we didn't lose a day, did we? No, we had, actually, we had we had very good weather, considering the time of year, don't you think? Okay, I suppose because so, even there, there, there were a few storms. In the even though it was cold, it was recall, usually sunny. I don't recall going to more than one hotel myself because I obviously wasn't involved in the scenes. I mean, I was staying, in, like we all were, at Newton Stewart. I don't think I stayed anywhere else. When you went to Plockton? No, you went no, in Plockton. No, I didn't. No, you went in Plockton. No, I didn't. And, uh, no, that's because the, you, were, you were actually down in Galloway. And all the scenes... Kukubrisha, surely. Well, it's the, prov Both. it's the province of Galloway. Kukubrisha oh, is the country. excuse me, I didn't know that. Well, oh, there everything. <laughs> you see, it foiled again. <laughs> Um, can we just say about the, the scene that we're watching, this is the interiors here are all shot in the, the Ellen Gowan Hotel. And the exterior that we saw very quickly is actually, it's, a, it's an estate agent in Gatehouse of Fleet. Um, it's recorded that, that the Ellen Gowan Hotel was the place where the cast would hang out when shooting was finished. And I was there just a few weeks ago and the people, the people who were there drinking of a Monday morning were remembering The Wicker Man as if it happened yesterday. What are your memories of that place? I didn't go there. Edward? Exactly as you said. Yes, we did hang out there. Um, when, we, when we hung out anyway, we, we didn't do a lot of hanging out, as far as I can remember, because we were working pretty early in the mornings, and, uh, and um, uh, we finished quite late at night, mostly. And um, So there wasn't a great deal, but uh, the pubs hardly changed. It's full of, uh, of photographs of the production, of course. And uh, uh, I was up there, as you know, some months ago, and people were pouring to that pub, shaking their hand and remembering the days. And, uh, and it's all exactly rather like us. <laughs> it's rather as though it happened yesterday. Uh, all of these locations are, were untouched. Just, you know, it, it's timeless. They're timeless. They're still there. They still look the same. A lot of the people are still and there. And these wonderful Scottish actors, because most of the people in the front of that scene... Not these. I mean, they are, of course, genuine musicians. Lindsay Kemp, I think he lives in Rome. He did years ago. But there, uh, and these two, I mean, these are very distinguished Scottish actors. Indeed, yes. Uh, we, we, we cast them from the Glasgow Citizens Theatre, which most of them belong to. Um, I don't think... Um, I don't think Oak... No, Oak, well, Oak actor, I don't think, it? actually, no. That's but, the but, big guy. But the, the two, one there with the, the beard. Two guys. The one who carried me up the steps. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Of the Wicker Man. Yes. Now, we're also seeing in this scene, you know, the first appearances of Britt Eckland. Um, tell me about the casting of Eckland. Why did you cast her? Jolly pretty, isn't she? <laughs> 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 yeah. Extraordinarily uh, pretty, um, yes. Uh, Peter Snell really cast her because, um, as you know, producers are, are particularly involved with the star names, and she had started to make her name then, and uh, we needed somebody with with a name for the leading actress, um, uh, or in effect, she was, I suppose, the leading actress. And um, uh, I met her, and I thought she was. Um, looked absolutely right for the part. Um, and the only problem that there seemed to be was whether she would be able to achieve the Scottish accent. And in fact, um, she did. She, uh, I thought she did very well. Um, of course, the singing was, was done because she never pretended that she could sing. 
um, and that we always knew we were going to do that. But it has been suggested that she was dubbed completely, and I don't think that's true at all. I, I think that, that's she her had her daughter with her, Victoria, didn't she? She had Peter had another Sella, one on Peter the way. Sellers. Uh, daughter, <laughs> yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Victoria was twelve, I think. Twelve, something like that. Yes. I think it's worth mentioning Lindsay Kemp, who is one of our foremost mimes. He doesn't normally talk in his performances. Still miming, still, still isn't miming, still, yes. Like still yes. But living in Rome still. Yeah. Mm. And uh, creating companies all over the world. He uh, he was not an obvious choice for the, for the uh, father of Brit, but I think that very fact works quite well in the film because it just seems so strange and Well, it's a very bizarre-looking yes, relationship, yes, yes. yes. Can we just say, just to clear this up once and for all, because as you know, it's passed into legend that all of Brit Eklund is dubbed and is dubbed by Annie Ross, the jazz singer. Eric Boyd Perkins, the editor of the film, does not remember her being dubbed at all. And as far as you, you, you remember, Robin, yeah. the voice that we're hearing now is Brit's voice. Correct. Okay. I'd heard the story that she'd had her voice dubbed. With a Scottish accent. Well, it's it's just because the song was done, Christopher. I think I was mm. convinced that mm. she had. Well, she's certainly convinced that she that she's dubbed. Does that it's it very not, well. it's she's done voice. it very well. <laughs> the landlord's daughter. That's a great number. We've already seen that, of course. Yes. With all of them dancing away. Now, is the scene in here with me and uh, Ash? You can. Can it's coming up. McGregor. After, after he gets up to his Yes, I, can, I remember that very well, Hardy. We will come to that in a minute, <laughs> what you did to me on that occasion. <laughs> yes, this was, I, I do remember this, um, this evening of filming. Oh, um, this is so wonderful, this, you know, because it, it's slow motion and also it's, it's very erotic and, and you, don't, you don't see too much, which is so vital in films these days. It's, you see a bit, but there's a tremendous amount of suggestion, and you really believe that this is happening. These um, are students from the Bristol Old Vic. Really? Mm. I must go down there sometime <laughs> and attend some of the performances. You do realise they're all 30 years old now. Yes, of course they are. <laughs> yes. So am I, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thought, isn't it? That's what always fascinates me. You know, there are these sort of 20, 25 yes, year olds right. sporting themselves and This lady is joining, drawing her old age pension. And she's now. drawing her old age pension, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure that I even remember that shot. Oh, yeah, very good. So, can you remember where that graveyard scene was shot, Robin? Uh, I, it, it was shot some, some graveyard near Newton Stewart. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, the version of the film that we're watching is the longest existent version. It's the 99-minute cut that's sometimes referred to incorrectly as the 102-minute cut. Um, it has all the sequences that were in your first director's cut. Um, are you happy with the version as it now stands? That's, I'd like to point out quickly, that's Paul Giovanni, the composer on the right. Oh, yeah, singing there. I'm going to interrupt you. I, I think, um, if I may suggest it, if I'm going to explain what happened to the cuts, you'll be, it'll take so long, that, I mean, that you may need to pause. Uh, um, well, this is a significant sequence that, of course, isn't yes, in the short version. This is very version. significant, yes. This very is significant, of... because this boy is about to lose his virginity. And I am the Lord of the Manor. It's the first time you see me, unlike the shorter version. Mm -hmm. It's the first time you see me, and I say, go up, Ash Buchanan, to Willow McGregor, to be initiated, so to speak, which he does very happily. And then Mr. Hardy, I'm not even referring to him as Robin, Mr. Hardy then sprang one on me, thank you, which you will shortly be coming to, in which I bend down and look at two snails having a very good time on a large rhubarb leaf. <laughs> the light was going rapidly. And Robin said to me, here's this little poem by Walt Whitman, do you think you could memorize this before it gets pitch dark and say the lines? I thought, I don't believe this. However, being, of course, a person with a rather peculiar memory, I managed to get it out. I've forgotten what I said now, quite frankly, well, but you will see it in a minute. But how significant is it that, as we know, there's, this is the long version of the film. There's a Paul Giovanni again. And this is a lovely song which is missing from the uh, short, short version. version. This is Gently Johnny. This is yes. Gently Johnny, which is Robert Burns, um, is uh, the lyric. But I don't, yes, because I don't remember seeing Paul singing. 
very often. I don't remember. No, he sang well. and Oh, he sang beautifully. Yeah, yeah. In fact, he sings more than this one. I think he sang something else as well. Yes, he may have done it. But when, when the film was shortened, you lost all this material. So the question is, how significant is it that this material be back now in well, the Well, very, film? because you, you start to see the conspiracy of, of the people in the pub. Um, in a minute, you're going to see what's on and the And the ceiling. conspiracy of the no. director towards his, one of his unfortunate actors. Here you have the snails, hard at it. Here am I looking up at the window and saying, I think I will turn or whatever, live with animals. And it's Whitman. And uh, to have Whitman sprung on you when it's getting dark is an experience, let's put it that way. And while you were doing that, there was I praying in another room. Yes. Exactly. Magic of you are praying. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. This is a tremendous scene. This is a tremendous scene. The, the, there are some scenes that you do in, in, in movies which are are in, incredibly difficult to do. And this, of course, was terribly difficult to do because Brit wasn't there. Uh, no, this was, must be one of the worst for you. It was terribly the, the, difficult. Uh, to know where to put one's hands. You know, because as I put my hands, you knew that Brit was going to put her hands in the same place the other side of the, the other room. So where you put your hands, where you put the body, you know, exactly how... how and I had to envisage all the time where she was and what she was going to be doing. And that's very difficult... Um, for a director to uh, actually get that into the actor's mind. Well, um, I was asked the other day, quite recently, what it was like. They were talking about you know, special effects and computer-generated uh, stuff, and they said to me, what's it like when you're working and there's uh, nobody behind the camera, nothing's coming from behind the camera because there's nothing there? And I, before I could stop myself, said, oh, I've experienced that quite frequently with some of my colleagues. <laughs> and there was a long, long silence. Without wanting to just drag you to practicalities, but this is important for people who don't know the film as well as you guys obviously do, in the abridged version, there is only one night of Howie staying on the island, and therefore you lose that sequence with Ash Buchanan, you lose all the material that we've just seen, and you, you lose a significant part of the of the backstory and of the theology of the piece. And do you, do you all agree that it is better that it is in there? Oh, absolutely. I think it's essential. Yes, because we haven't essential. come to this scene of the temptation by Brit on the other side of the wall. We haven't come to that. Yet. No, 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 that's, that's on the second night. It's like, a, it, 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 you see, if you, if, you, if you hack something as badly as this was hacked, uh, a, a, it's totally dismissive of the movie. Um, but also... It, it says a tremendous amount for the audiences throughout the world who still managed to feel a love for this film, uh, mm. to be caught up with this film. And, and, uh, and it, the whole idea of not having the background, uh, especially you know, the whole of the religious background, is, uh, it's, it's awful. It's absolutely diabolical. Uh, thank God it's no. all back. It thank God it's back. It was butchered, and I still believe deliberately. I have no proof, only suspicions. But well, um, whether it was deliberate or not, what, what, it was totally uncaring, wasn't it? I mean, totally. You know, it was and totally, after totally all, this film has become to any piece of one work. of the great cult movies mm. of the cinema, and rightly, in my opinion. Well, again, well, one, this is one of the scenes which is which is um, also key in telling the audience if if if. Uh, they want to listen and watch um, what this island is about um, because the maypole has been crowned, which is obviously a sort of uh, sexual um, representation. The pole has been, uh, has been crowned with the wreath in the same way as um, uh, might have happened the night before uh, with, um, uh, if he had actually been able to make love to, uh, as she hoped he would, uh, to Willow. And now he sees that the girls uh, are uh, in tune with this uh, maypole dancing and that their teacher is going to ask them what it represents. And their answer is that uh, it represents the fertility 
uh, ritual. And she says, um, it's the image of the penis in our... In our I just uh, love the way she says it. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes, the wonderful, wonderful, yeah, wonderful poetic, way she says it. it. Just so, so poetic. poetic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about who we're seeing on screen, who the actress is, Robin. Mm. Um, this is... Um, you say exactly what I've forgotten. This is Diancio Lento. Who married Tony Shepard. Indeed. And is now sadly a widow. She was once married to Sean Connery, mm. and um, then she married Tony Shaffer. In fact, I think I'm right in saying that they actually met during this production. They did. They did That's indeed. Right. And went to Australia, what, about a year later? To Queensland. Later, yes. Started their whole Into the theater, middle of nowhere in Queensland, the of yes. Mm. And as far as I know, she's there now. Her father, of course, was a very, very distinguished surgeon. Australian. Hmm. So, in a sense, I think by birth she is Australian, although the name is she more is a, Italian. Uh, he, he was an Italian. Uh, well, the name uh, is Australian, Italian, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the church and the and the house which they're in now are both located at Amworth and are both easily visitable if anybody yeah. is interested. And well, they well, do, the deserted church still does look exactly like that. The cottage is right away across. Exactly, the sure. You can the, literally uh, throw a stone at it from the yeah. church. Yeah. I envy you. You know, you've both been back. I never have. It was it was strange. It was so so strange, going back, especially for me, going back to this place, uh, and to the and to the to the uh, the, the, the to borrow head the, the yard, you know, the, uh, the the bone yard, as it were. It's all still there. It's all you close your eyes and it's all happening again. That's another clue there, of what their religion is. The things that have been written on the blackboard, which you don't see, unfortunately, too clearly. You well, see the whole no. of it. It's just it, a little, you know, it's a little soup song of... Uh, yeah, it's a long of puzzle, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Edward, tell me something about the, this, this character because it's, it would be very easy to play Howie simply as uptight and difficult and unsympathetic. And you're walking this very fine line between yeah. him being, you know, a man of extreme virtue and, you know, a, and a bigot. And I, we were speaking before and I said it's something to do with the way he physically holds himself that gives you that sense of tension. Tell me how you, what you thought of the character, how you found your way into it. Well, actors work in different ways uh, and, um, you know, some people will will, will go for the, the walk, other people will go for the sound of the voice. The, um, I, I actually had this uniform made one, one size too small. Um, well, it was made, and then it was taken in uh, far more. To um, to to make him as stiff as possible. I, I know that I, I found it very difficult to sit down when I was wearing it, and I couldn't bend down. Um, this whole thing was holding, hold, he was held back all the time. And the other thing that was astonishingly important about the character was to make sure that he, his religion was the most important thing in his life. His, 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 his following Jesus, his whole... Life was uh, centred on this, and it went into his police work as well. So, in a way, he was a, a damn good policeman. Uh, but at the same time, I wouldn't like to have been, uh, a, you know, one of his uh, his junior officers. I, was, I, I think one of those because uh, um, has always said that you know it's his favourite movie. I, I certainly it's one of mine, and it's certainly my favourite character. Ever, ever to play. There is something just about you know, the physical set of your body. You know, you said, for example, you know, the, the, the uniform is slightly too tight, but it's mm. everything. It's right down to the way you're holding your, your jaw, and it's almost like the haircut seems slightly... Everything but in him you, seems... You do. You do. If you, if you, if you restrict your body uh, even slightly, uh, then it affects every part of your body. It affects your head and your, you know... Uh, it, 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 so it... From one thing, the rest follows, as it were. Was Edward always the first choice for this role, Robin? Well, um, no. Actors never are. He, he wasn't, no. actually. Uh, we, but one of the reasons was that um, um, uh, I had a friend and neighbor whom, when this was first written, I thought would be good for it, which is Michael York. And he couldn't do it. Um, and then um, Peter and Tony suggested Edward, and I, of course, had seen him on television, and I thought at once what a brilliant suggestion it was. 
I'm I all, think if always I may been so grateful speak to as another York. actor that uh, Edward's performance in this is quite remarkable because as far as I'm concerned, uh, you're not looking at an actor acting. And with Michael, whom I know very well and like very much, he's not anywhere near as strong a physical presence as you are. And he would have been a bit more willowy or whatever the phrase is, a little bit more sort of... Um, Looking back, I can't visualize how he would have done it, actually. Uh, well, uh, um, he would have done it. Uh, uh, he would he have done it, done but... Uh, it, but uh, no but I, I, I don't think there now. is any actor who could have done it better than no, Edward. No, absolutely not. I think I'll just, uh, I think I'll retire now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody in the film could have done it any better than the people that you've got. <laughs> no, I agree. Mm, I agree. Honest. Now, let's just, because this is going to be a recurrent theme, but we need to clear it up. When you cut the film originally, you cut, as we said, this version that we're watching now, this 99-minute cut. We know it was cut down to 87 minutes, and uh, the story is that Michael Dealey, who was the producer who'd taken over at British Line for Peter Snell, couldn't find a distributor for the film and therefore cut it down to sell it. Um, are you all agreed that that's what happened? Christopher, you sort of uh, hinted towards darker motives. Well, I did. I have no proof whatsoever. It's merely suspicion. It's a kind of a tradition in the entertainment industry, and particularly in films. And I'm not now casting aspersions upon Mr. Dealey or anybody else, for that matter, but when somebody takes over a new job from somebody else, the first thing they usually do is cancel their predecessor's production plans. Now, that didn't happen. But what shattered me, as I've said many times, and of course it's in my book, and it's in the books about The Wicker Man, mm -hmm was that I went with my wife and my then agent to see the film, not what we're looking at now, but the 80-odd minute version. I went to see it in the projection room uh, of British Lion, in Broadwick House, I think it was. Saw the film and I thought, good heavens, this is it's a marvelous film, but there's so much missing, so much wonderful stuff missing, and we'll come to a bit of that later. And I thought, oh, dear, oh, dear, anyway. I thought, well, we'll be able to put that right with the negative and the outtakes and so on and so forth. Went upstairs to say thank you to Michael Dealey for showing us the film. He didn't get up when my wife walked in, which is an inevitable sign of lack of manners. And uh, I wasn't impressed. And he said, well, what do you think of the film? And I said, well, I, I think it's extremely expensive. Uh, impressive film. My wife said the same, and my agent, the late Dennis Selinger, said the same. He said, I think it's an extraordinary movie, and we should be all very, very proud of it. And Michael's answer was, I think it's one of the ten worst films I've ever seen. The moment he said that, I realized that there was a possibility, no more than that, a possibility that it wouldn't be seen for whatever motive. Well, to begin with, it wasn't. It wasn't given a press show, as I'm sure everybody knows. Why not? It wasn't given any publicity. Why not? It was buried. I did something I've never done in my entire life. I wrote to all the critics I knew in London, because eventually it came on as the second half of the double bill. I think it was the Gomart in the Haymarket, wasn't it? I think it was. It was mm. one of those cinemas. Mm. And uh, second half to Don't Look Now, which is another British Lion film, and a very good one. And I rang up all the critics, and I said, look, I've never done this before, but as you haven't seen the film, please go and see it, and if you want me to pay for your seats, I'd be only too delighted. Well, almost all the critics did go, and the reviews were extraordinary. I can rem almost quote some of them. And one said, in fact, more than one, this is a better film than Don't Look Now. Well, that's a matter of opinion. But I still believe and I have no proof, absolutely none. I still believe that somewhere the negative and the art text of the Wicker Man still exists. Now, I've been told, because Robin went and had a look, Tony Schaeffer had a look, Peter Snell had a look. I didn't, I wasn't in a position to do this. But they all searched laboratories and, you know, all the various places where films are kept in studios and everywhere else. No sign, absolutely none. And... I was told this, and then sometime later I was told that Peter Snell had been shown a hole in a road where they were digging somewhere at Shepperton, I suppose. And there were many, many cans of film in this hole. 
And somebody there, maybe the foreman, maybe one of the workmen, I don't know, said, oh, by the way, the wicker man's down there. Now, I don't know if it's true or not. I have no idea. And as I said, I have no proof. But I feel this is immensely important, which is why I've gone on at length about it. I think it's absolutely disgraceful for the negative of any film to disappear and the outtakes as well. And I still believe to this day that someone knows what happened to them. It can't have been an accident. You don't just lose. How many cans, Robin? I imagine a 20 or so. You can't just lose 20 cans of film. And I think it's somewhere under another title or under no title at all. That's my own personal feeling about it. And as I said many, many times, I have no proof. I just feel that this happened, and I'm not going to go into the matter any further. I have my own opinions. Uh, some people share them. Other people think I'm wrong. I've said this at some considerable length because I think it's enormously important. Mm -hmm. One of the best British pictures ever made should not only be cut to bits, but that when you want to re-edit it, I was quite prepared to pay for it to be re-edited and mixed and said so, if you recall, Robin. I think it's an absolute disgrace and a shame on the British film industry with a major company like British Lion that a film should disappear 30 years ago, nearly, and never be seen again. How does a film disappear unless it's deliberate? That's, I mean, it could be a mistake, but I personally have my doubts. It's worth saying here that the, the reason we are now able to watch what is the restored version is that after the film had been cut to 87 minutes and the negative had been lost, um, a complete print of it was found in the offices of Roger Corman. And Robin, you restored this version from that print. Is that correct? Yes. Actually, the sequence of events, I think, was this. Um, my director's cut was probably the 102 minutes. It went to Roger Corman to decide whether he wanted to distribute the film. He said, yes, he did. And he offered, I think, $50,000, mm. which wasn't as much money as Mr. Dealey and Mr. Spikings felt the film should get. Um, uh, and uh, he justified that by saying he was going to spend a lot of money on the distribution. Um, and uh, I think he was being the perfect distributor. He was famous for, for this kind of film. Um, anyway, his editor kept the print. So when we wanted to restore the film to its full length, uh, we had to go to him, I'm very lucky to find the print was there, in order to restore the film with the missing scenes. Mm -hmm. However, uh, after the, um, the film had arrived in his care, um, Roger Corman had sent a letter to um, Peter Snell saying he thought that certain cuts were worth making. One of them was the apple scene, could be cut shorter, and various other small cuts. Mm -hmm. And he was quite specific about them. Mm -hmm. And we made those cuts, and that's the 99-minute version. But that's the version that he had in his vault. No, it's not. He had the 102-minute version. But we took, remember, all we did from that version, we used it as a negative, mm -hmm. an internegative. Mm -hmm. And we took those scenes out, and we restored... Um, what, in effect, um, we had cut back in, uh, back in England. That, that, that was my final cut. My final cut was then cut again back in England by Mr. Dealey when he took out the two nights and just put one night and took Willow's dance from the second night and put it in the first night and took Christopher's scene with the snails out altogether. And he took Gently Johnny, the song, out altogether. And he took the opening out altogether. Are so you, that's how it came down from 102 to 99. Are you saying, and this is crucial, that there is a print somewhere that has the Apple sequence? Which, yes, uh, Christopher, yes, yes. You think there, there is? Be, yes, there must yes. be somewhere, because yes. when we come to it, uh, we can go into this in slightly more detail if necessary. But Now, that is the exterior of my home, Summer Isle's home. As you can see, there are palm trees there because it's the um, Gulf Stream in Scotland, and it's genuine. There's, there's it's Calaine plant. Castle. Calaine Castle. There's a, a flat in there which was given to General Eisenhower as a result of World War II. This, on the other hand, is another house, which is the interior of the house belonging to the Earl of Stair. Floors, isn't it? Floors? 
Floors, is it? Was it? No, that's Roxburgh's house. Isn't it? I think Floors Castle is Roxburgh's house. Is it? Oh. Now, this is Stair's house, which he kindly allowed us to shoot in. And uh, I think he's, well, this I scene, hope he's still with us. But this, this, of course, is the first time I appear in the short version. This is Stair's house, as you say. But when Edward walks through to the dining room, we are actually in Calais. Yes, mm. yeah. I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, saves, what saves this vast amount of dialogue? I mean, when I read this, I thought 12 pages of nonstop talk. Nobody on earth is going to keep the attention of the audience on them for that length of time. I don't care who they are. And where you got round it so well, starting right now, where you got round it so well, was that you moved us around from one position to another, from standing up to sitting down, and then moving us out of one room into another room and then out of the other room. You see me pick up a knife, which, of course, is for the apples. You never know why. In the next sequence in the dining room, after I've spoken about my grandfather, how incredibly um, formidable or benevolent he looks, yes. essentially the face of a man incredulous of all human good. I mean, wonderful writing. And... Respect foul there's play. this great, this great line of that Edward, he, um, well, that you have, when Edward is, registers this incredible shock, starting to realise what these people are really about. In, in this scene, is one well, of my favourite scenes in the film. Yes, I must say, I, I do have to say, at the, at the risk of, you know, sort of, uh, we're all standing around patting each other on the back. I do have to say that I think this is one of the best directed movies I've ever seen. Robin, I really think I, I've always thought that. I've always thought you directed it absolutely superbly, absolutely superbly. And I don't understand why you're not making movie after movie after movie. That's what I don't understand. Can I interject? Because you don't want to. A bit of significant trivia here, which is that you are asking, how are they dancing naked? To which you reply, which I reply naturally, it's much too dangerous to jump through the fire with your clothes on. <laughs> but of course, they are enjoying their divinity lesson. They do so love their divinity lesson. But now. We're moving around all the time because yeah. Robin's doing that with his camera. And this is what saves this vast amount of dialogue. But in a minute, you will see, I mean, he's appalled. How oh, he's appalled. What of the Christian God? What of him? I say, oh, well, he had his chance and he blew it. What? And I think my answer to that was, surely you mean who? And I think that was cut. I'm not too sure. It was. Yeah, pity. It's a great line in reply. It's a typical, rather unkind, unkindly benevolent line, but typical of the character. I, I think it seemed like a, a put down too far, really, at the time to us. Well, yeah. fair enough. You know, I mean, uh, you, you, I mean, look you, at the poor man. Really, he's he's, he's already, he's already stunned enough. Into it. <laughs> yes. yes. Without having I his grab say, attack. There, there was one <laughs> other thing in this film which um, was daunting for me. And that is that uh, I, I'm English. I'm not Scottish. Scots. Oh, I thought you were. And I spent, luckily, I spent about four years of my life as a young actor doing rep in uh, St Andrews and Dundee and in Perth and played a lot of Scotsmen. And uh, thank God I had because uh, the difficulty was... Uh, it's not difficult to do one or two scenes in, in, in an accent or a dialect. The difficulty is... Being totally consistent, and that used to worry me occasionally. I thought you were Scott. <laughs> no, I really no, did, no. because no. Your, your accent is faultless. <laughs> now, see, I mean, this is where I'm looking at the portrait of my grandfather, which of course is in a sense a portrait of me with a beard, looking rather like John Brown, although he wasn't as tall as that. But um, we then walk into the dining room, and I pick up a knife because I'm going to show him the apples, and I'm going to take a piece out. Of the so we've now walked taste. into Calaine Castle. The, now walked the into Calaine Castle. We saw. And as you will see, I pick a knife out because I'm going to show him right now a sort of paring knife or whatever you like to call it because I'm going to dig into the apples, which we don't see, and he's going to taste a bit. Now, from here, we walked outside and we walked, if I remember correctly, into Logan Botanical Gardens, into the greenhouse. Yes, it was which is not in the film. From the greenhouse, the hothouse, we walked into another part where um, I'm showing various implements and how apples are grown and so on and so forth and why and so on and so forth. And this scene of us walking in the garden 
We are not actually saying what you're hearing, because it was a much, much longer scene. I would just like to mention my favorite line from the film, because it took place a little bit earlier than this. We shot it, of course. And um, it's absolutely superb, because it, it's one of the... Well, I need to say, of course, I've lost it. Uh, wait a minute. It's all about... Well, I'll come to it in a minute. Just be patient. I have it right here. Right. So it's, it's the best line. Oh, this is a, a pagan, possibly, but not an not enlightened one. Um, and your Christian cop, I had one. Yeah, well, I thought I was amazed that it was a voiceover. I thought that you'd shoot it with us, with him getting into the, 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 the uh, whatever you call it, the broom, or the, 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 whatever, and me saying that line to him. But it was a voiceover. It got a big laugh. But quite a long way previous to this, there's a very sinister comment that I make here. The old gods, to reverence them and appease them if necessary, that comes into this, we're just looking at, which a lot of people probably missed. One hopes they did, in a sense. But before this, inside, there's a line he set to work. Almost immediately, he met opposition from the fundamentalist priest who threw tons of his artificial fertilizer into the harbor on the grounds that if God had meant us to use it, he would have provided it. <laughs> I looked up in the air, and to my great dismay, that is not in the film because I thought that was the funniest line in the entire picture. Perhaps it was felt to be too irreverent. I don't know. <laughs> I think it may have been. I don't know either. Now, this element of finding the hair in the grave, when I asked you about this before, Robin, you said that the one thing you thought had come from ritual was the idea of the hair. Is that correct? No, it wasn't so much the hair. I don't think it was actually the hair, but it was the transmutation of souls. Um, in, in, uh, I think it was actually a butterfly or something in, in ritual. Um, the idea that when people um, souls left their bodies, they could um, be transmuted into animals or even trees and plants, uh, which is a, which was certainly a, a pagan notion. Um, and since the whole thing about her being a hare uh, has been the theme throughout, uh, we now finally see her as a hare. Um, is the ultimate joke they're playing on him, but it also is not unconnected with their real belief. And so ritual suggested that, if you like, the, the transmutation of cells, but that's all. And there's a hair on that, on that um, mm. uh, cup. Oh, yeah. I've been trying for a very, very long time, as I'm sure you know, Robin, because I asked you, to find the full version of The Tinker of Rye, which Diane and I are singing. Um, I think I've pretty well tracked all of it down. I know certainly what I sang. It's extremely suggestive. It's very bawdy. And it's meant to be. And obviously there is this very strong connection between Summer Isle and the lady we are looking at now. I would say she's inevitably his mistress. I would say. I mean, I, that I took this for granted. No, I think that's very probable. But the, um, fact, the fact that they're both singing together and she's holding a cup which has a hair on it... Um, they're singing together this very bawdy ballad because it is very bawdy and I haven't been able to find it anywhere. One of the things that fascinates me about the film as well is that you have to understand that the whole, the whole story, almost from beginning to end, certainly the minute he arrives, uh, certainly the, when the message arrives that, that, that this girl is missing, the whole thing is a setup. The whole thing, mm. one thinks to oneself, how did they rehearse this? You know, did, you know they had to rehearse it at some time. Has it happened before? You say, before? I will do this, then you'll do this, and then so-and-so will do, you know. Mm. And, then, and then we'll sing this song, and they must have chosen the song. Then they had and all of the... All planned. All, that was all planned, all directed. Uh, and it's the story within the story that gets more and more fascinating. That that is why the, that. That's why the first scene with Christopher is so important. Which, which is missing, yes. because then you you have a hint that he's the magus behind all this. Absolutely. And so you start oh, yes. to, sense, to sense that. To save his own and skin, among other things. Yes, yes. But it's also possible that they've gone through this ritual or are going through this ritual now because it might conceivably have happened before and they're taking no chances again Well, some time. of it has happened before because when, when you make that speech, um, when they're stirring the tar and preparing to go uh, with their costumes. That's true. Yes. 
Yes. The which has become, the which has become to, uh, sacred yes. to our right. Yes, that's right. It's become sacred to our right. I don't mean the ceremony. I mean something going wrong. Oh, yes. So this is all a massive confidence trick. Oh, yes, absolutely. Brilliant. I what think it is, origin- it is worth saying that um, Tony Schaffer, who wrote the screenplay, his previous major work was Sleuth, mm. which was a play in which people played games with each other. Mm. And one of the great, I mean, I worked with him for 15 years or so, the great um, uh, entertainment he bought uh, to working with him was he was constantly devising games. Mm. And this is his ultimate game. I mean, the reason why he, I don't think he did very much after this was because he'd, he'd gone to the <laughs> ultimate. And yeah. this was a game in which one person, the, uh, the Christopher Lee character, um, plots with a whole group of people um, against one other person, yeah. Edward. He never did uh, anything better than this. He never did an, anything else, really, that, that um, uh, was on these lines. I mean, no, obviously he did no, no, other, other films, but nothing, nothing on these Am lines. Right it was the assuming, end of his game playing. Am yes. I right in assuming that a lot of the research, uh, both by Tony and by you, uh, came from Frazier's Golden Bough. Yes, I, I had all 25 volumes with me. Good grief. Um, I don't say I read all of them, but they were very useful. And the songs, the song that you talked about, The Tinker of Rye, I'm pretty sure came from the Sharps uh, collection in London. But you looked, didn't you? Yes, I did. Well, I, I, I couldn't have gone back through the archive of Sharps. It would have taken me days. Mm. And I had all this stuff with me when, I, when we were doing the research. And I think what happened was that Peter Schaffer, who really oversaw all the songs, um, you know, unboundarizing them and that sort of thing, probably took a small fragment that I'd found and and uh, and uh, elaborated on it. Hmm. Now we're seeing that the moment of realization here. This is the point oh, yes, at which there she is, with no harvest. There's the missing picture, which was missing from the wall. Of Rowan Morrison, and all is bare around her. Now, is now this presumably that's a flashback? Yes, 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 must be. Yeah. Yes, of course. There's the bare wall. It's worth saying as well that in that flashback, when we see all those plants that are in blossom, the blossoms are all either stuck on or the trees are imported. And of course, you, Edward, have told the story about. I know. And and it's totally denied. Would you like to repeat Totally it? denied. I swear, I swear that they were moving those some trees around behind me as at one point when the when the um um I am told that I'm talking through the back of my head. Um but I still have the memory. And I don't think it's a false memory. I perhaps it is. The, 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 the blossoming trees were the, brought up. The, and then some of the blossoming trees, because they weren't enough, they took them round behind, and as it got clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, they were there again. Now, I, I, I can remember. Now, maybe, maybe someone was just carrying the trees away. They were finished with. I don't know. No, but I, I think, have this I think, memory. I think that's quite likely because um, that, that you, you, you're correct because the gardens are actually subtropical. I mean, they really are. You, can see, mm. you can't fake a palm. Well, we couldn't. We didn't fake palm trees. They were really there. Um, and the other subtropical plants. But, of course, you wouldn't normally have apple blossom trees in a tropical garden. So the, they, oh, had they, were be, all, they had to be introduced. They were all plastic, weren't they? Or whatever. Yes, they were, they were. <laughs> yes. Silk or whatever. Now, we have you know, one of the most famous scenes from the film happening here. Firstly, your bedroom and Britt Eklund's bedroom were not even in the same house, were they? They were in different buildings. No, as far as I know. They, no, they weren't. They weren't in the same house. No. And you shot the two sides of this dance on separate nights. So you were having mm. to choreograph your movement. Had she already done her side of the dance when you did yours? The song had been done so that, um, and the um, the knocking sound. Mm. Yes, uh, I think it had. Had she done it. her dance? Well, yes, because we had to play back. That's to right. You of course, you did. Yes, the, of course. And you had were. to know exactly where yes, she was going yes, to go, yes, so yes, that you yes, could yes. tell me where I had to yes. go. Yes, indeed. And again, famously, some of the appearances of Brit Eklund here are body doubled. Why did that happen? Only one, I think. Well, this one obviously wasn't. Um, uh, well. It's, it's when she starts to do the slapping. And the slapping is so that he can hear the slapping 
of her flesh through the through the wall, uh, and that's you know, obviously more erotic for the poor man. And um, when she uh, actually starts really going with the rhythm of the slapping and the banging of the wall, um, we had her turn completely round, and she didn't like she didn't like our seeing her back uh, because she felt that uh, it didn't present her in the best way and she asked us to get a double and so we had to get um, a young dancer from Glasgow to come and play this next shot of her not this one that one that one mm -hmm. yeah and that is a girl who uh, just has that one scene who we brought up from Glasgow for the uh, shooting of this sequence. And the voice of her singing in this sequence is... Annie Ross. And Edward, tell me about doing your side of this dance because mm. it, it's it's one of those scenes which, you know, could have gone either way. It could have been embarrassing. Oh, it yes, could have been. Could so have been. how did you get yourself into it and how did you manage it? Well, actually, very simply, I mean, I, as a man, imagined Britt Eklund doing it. <laughs> I mean, there was no other way to do it. You had to imagine this. You had to know what was, you know, what was going on. You had to become almost uh, uh, a, a man who has never been in italics erotic. How, how does he behave? He pres what we plumped for was that, that he goes over the top that he almost goes into madness. I mean, the man is almost mad at the end of this. And, and I mean, mentally, mentally upset, song, hasn't he? Of course, absolutely. And, yes. and he's had the slap you, well, you might well have imagined yourself the other side of the wall. Of course. And taking over. Of course, and yeah, that, that's an anathema, of course, a horror to a Christian oh, gentleman. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. it would have been, you know, as I say, he was on the edge of madness here. There is a, a sequence in the novel Ritual which very closely mirrors this, but which ends up with the, um, the man licking the design off the wallpaper. Mm. I'm awfully glad that our director didn't suggest that. <laughs> I, never read, I never read Ritual. Um, uh, I, was told, I did, but I must say I don't I, remember I was told either. about it, about the butterflies. Mm -hmm. I never read the book. There was a detective, a strange detective. He yes, had and, it eyes or something. and it turns out to be the detective turns out to be the killer. Yes, and he goes to see some some boy who looks like a young version of the God Pan <coughs> or something. I can't remember much about it. He's investigating the disappearance of a, 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 in, a in a community which he has which violet be. eyes or something. The detective, I think, or something very strange. All the boy does. Actors work in different ways. To I don't know how Chris works. I. Uh, I can't do too much research. And the reason I can't do too much research, I mean, for instance, I, I, I read about, about uh, the rituals and I went, did that. You know. but it is all in the script. And uh, often actors, <coughs> if they do too much research, you start saying, look, why can't we do this? Or we should do this. Or, you know, I think you see, this is what. And basically what you do is you do the script which is what you've accepted in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and after all, we are actors, and so we have to imagine. Added to which, if you've got any sense at all, you listen to your director extremely intently. Now, just to pick up again the different versions of The Wicker Man, because I know this is a, a, a source of much controversy. Like, as I said, the version that we're watching is the longest existent version, which is currently referred to as the director's cut. The shortened version is 87 minutes. When it was theatrically re-released in America, it actually ran at 96 minutes, three minutes shorter than the version that we're watching now. That was the version that you restored from the Roger Corman print. Correct. Why was that version shorter? Why, did, why didn't you just restore everything? Well, because we couldn't afford to. Mm -hmm. Um, we tried to take them, I mean, we were doing it, uh, two students from Tulane University who persuaded a lot of doctors and dentists to put in $5,000 each, actually provided the money for this film's major distribution in the United States and bicycled it around um, with Christopher uh, and myself. Um, and the restoration was uh, the biggest cost, really, that we had before we actually went out with the, with the distribution. And yes, uh, I was living in Los Angeles, and Robin was living in New York. 
and we met up in New Orleans. And we showed the film at Baton Rouge, University of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And then we showed it in Jackson, Mississippi, where we were both made colonels, if I remember correctly. And um, I miss out on all good things. The interesting <laughs> thing was that we showed this film to the various religious denominations in case they would, re, you know, find it. At a it, prayer breakfast. Yes, um, particularly in the Deep South, uh, where they're very, very, very insistent upon everything being correct yes. in, in religious terms. And we showed this to quite a gathering of uh, clerical people, some with their wives, some obviously not. And we said, I remember very clearly, do you, as men of the church, do you find anything offensive about this film? Because after all, some of the things that I say, being a pagan but totally in character, are extremely blasphemous to some people. And they said, not at all, because virtue triumphs in the end, etc., to a certain extent. Oh, they also To a certain said. extent. And they said, we will tell our congregations to that effect. They, they also, I think, liked the film, and they certainly articulated this because mm. they said we have never seen a, f a film in which um, the um, the reward of heaven for a Christian and resurrection in the Christian sense is actually um, uh, articulated and and can easily be understood. Um, it's counterpointed with the pagan belief. Um, in the film, but it's nonetheless there. And they loved the prayer that Edward says at the end of the film. Um, I mean, they found it literally faithful to the tenets of the Christian religion. As a result, they were prepared to go to the pulpit and sell it. <laughs> but to, uh, to, to nail this version's thing, and then I'll leave this alone, um, the theatrical version was three minutes shorter than this version that we're watching. And as I was alluding to at the very beginning, some, uh, most of that three minutes comes from the very opening scenes, doesn't it? What yes, is, yes, mm, yes. To yeah. the best of your memory, is yeah, that what police, was cut? Yes. Basically the police. yes, one way of shortening films, of course, is to take a little bit out of every scene all the way through the film, simply to, you know, to speed the rhythm of it. Um, and our earlier cuts were done with, with that. But um, you're correct in what you say. Now, we're moving towards the final act of the film now. It's always been um, a source of some concern to me that the, the plane not working. Are we to assume that the plane has been sabotaged or are we to, to assume that somehow the gods have just well, prevented I, him I from leaving? Oh, That's sabotaged. That's my feeling. Absolutely. No, no oh, doubt. Yes, no. Because, after all, if it just been the gods, there wouldn't have been all those people waiting behind the no. wall to no. see what happened. The only thing is that if they actually sabotage the plane... It, it's the only element of the, it not being entirely his own doing that he's in the place. It's the only place in which they actually conspire to stop him from leaving. Well, it's the only time he, he tries to leave, so it would be the only time they conspire to, to, to stop him leaving. I mean, as I said before, everything was a plot. It's all part of the plot. If he was... They, they, they would have said... Uh, if he, what happens if he tries to leave? Well, don't worry, we've got the spark plug or we've got whatever, whatever, whatever. So we can't leave. So, I mean, you know, it, it never even occurred to me that there was anything else but uh, deliberate action on their part. That's me doing my Nureyev. Yes, he was awfully good in doing a Nureyev, was <laughs> Chris. Uh, he leapt very high. I mean, I reckon he went up 12 feet. He's six foot five or whatever it is, and his leap is about six foot. <laughs> yes, well, you know, I mean, I... <laughs> They did ask me about the Olympics. <laughs> yes, I said yes. I just didn't have the time. I was making yes. the film. There was one. I just want to say one en, en passant too. It is a slightly light uh, note. Um, it 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 it, it, so it was always a joy working with Chris, but it was difficult because um, I'm 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 you know I'm five foot ten. Uh, well, I say five foot ten. I think I'm five foot nine and a half. But uh, you know. Uh, and he is what, six foot four, aren't you? Or six mm, foot five? Six foot four, yeah. There is a, there, and, you, and the whole thing is you, you, you actors, actors of any kind of worth whatsoever have to look each other in the eyes mm -hmm. 
No, it was awfully difficult to look. So I worked out well, a technique. I was I never conscious of that. I worked out, well, no, because I worked out a technique that I looked where I knew your eyes were, but because the, because the, again, the sniff, sniff, stiffness, you will actually watch, if you watch it, you will actually see my eyes go up, but my head hardly moves at all. <laughs> so I, you know. I've so, never noticed yeah, that Yeah, so we, 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 did, uh, we did have eye contact all the way through. It, it, it worked beautifully. All the scenes between you and me worked extremely well because of your total incomprehension of what was going yes, well. on around me. Disbelief, rage, anger, disgust, and my just treating the whole thing as if you were slightly mentally deficient. But also, you, you know, mentioned earlier before. You on. mentioned earlier before the whole, the whole of every single actor there had exactly that <coughs> quality, didn't they? Mm, mm. They, 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 they were they, all so nice. All were so oh, they were so delightful to Howie, mm, and mm. and all this wonderful, wonderful game playing. You were very nice to Howie. Everybody was very nice Everybody to Howie, was. which made it ten times worse Even than at the, the very poor end. devil. Even at the very end, yes. we are conferring oh, yes. upon you the greatest Absolutely. gift we can give. Yes. And, well, we'll come to that later, because uh, I have been asked many times, and I don't really know what the answer is, whether Summer Isle is doing all this in case it happens to him, because you say it will one day, mm -hmm. or whether he really does mean and believe what he's saying. I think he believed. I always said. So. I think I he's totally sincere. As though he believed yeah, I wholly think so. in what he said. But whether he thinks that he will be held responsible if the harvest doesn't work is another matter, of course. Well, I think you register your slight shock and doubt at that accusation in that last scene. I th I, yes, I, I, I did, I, yes. Yeah, and, and, somebody you know, said it, I looked it, rather it, grim. It brought you up a little bit. Well, well, yes, of yeah. course, because I thought, oh, wait wait a minute, you know, we can't have this. Now, of course, the movement of the final act is that, um, is that Howie is outside of these festivities, and it is true that in all the indications of the festivities, it looks like everyone is really enjoying themselves. There is a sense of the pagan coming in. What was it like doing that stuff? Because one of the reasons the film works is because it's not held up to ridicule. It's, um, it's made to be celebratory and enjoyable. Well, well I, I think it's a, something that's been going on for so many years that the islanders have grown up with, and indeed... So have I. And I think that it's become a part of their lives, obviously, every year, and the most important part of their lives every year. So I think they are genuinely, as you will see from their smiling faces when they're singing Summer Is It Coming In, they are genuinely delighted, not only to have found a solution to the probability of a bad harvest, but they really do believe that they are doing how it a great, the greatest favour in their power. These, I feel they really are. These scenes were cut. Yes. That we've just seen. And you can <laughs> see and, and, on, and on the ship, of course, because yeah. uh, how he goes on the ship. Summer Isle apples, you see empty boxes. Mm. Everything, that's what's so marvellous about this film, is that there isn't a wasted shot. Every shot tells a story, which you should take a great deal of the credit, Robin. Oh, thank you. Every shot tells a story. Even this somewhat vertiginous one. What does vertiginous mean? It means you can get vertigo if you're too high up. Oh, I see. <laughs> looking down on someone. I thought I'd explain I'm just a know. simple, ordinary everyday But all actor. these characters, you see, that's another thing. All these characters, the baker, the fishmonger, yes. the chemist, all of them had, the doctor, had very definite roles quite, I won't say very long, a very important part, and so much was cut. I, I, one thing I did worry about the film is the scene we've just seen, the little tiki, I think it's called, it's a Hawaiian thing. No, it's Maori. Outside. What? It's Maori. It's Maori, is it? Okay. Mm. Well, it still seemed out, it seemed out of place to me at the time, and we were moving so fast that I didn't really have time to that's, of course, the hand of glory missing yes. from the body. I mean, a lot of people may not have picked that up. And she's the same lady who was in the in the library. Yes. yes. Well, with the coins over her eyes, which, of course, is traditional amongst yeah. many rites and um, peoples, it'd be a bit difficult to tell that it was the same person. Yes. I have a house, and I've stayed in it. I've had it for about five or six years now, in Padstow in Cornwall, in England, which, of course, has 
every May the 1st, the great Obios, uh, yes, which goes yes, around yes, the streets. Yes. They have the, uh, the original leather one, which is God knows how many years old. And they have another one, which is a junior, which is the, 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 the children, the kids do theirs the day before. There are two obioses, and they start at different parts of the town, and they merge around, and there is something absolute... Every I, I've, so, I've seen it once. Uh, I go down there every year and all the time, but I've only ever seen it once. And it is... It, it takes me completely, <laughs> completely to Summer Isle. Mm. Completely but to the, the, to the, 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 the um, hobby horse. T- yes. Tony saw it, and, and I never have, but Tony <coughs> told me that he... Um, that the women had gone out of town and they had been followed by the hobby horse with mm-hmm. tar on his skirts. Mm. And um, and that the local population hadn't been at all pleased about his his following them while they were doing this. Does that ring a bell? But, but that, that, there is a, it's a very it's a very tight uh, tight community. Mm. Uh, it's uh, it's ancient, of course. I mean, nobody knows when it started there. Uh, it is. Guarded, uh, uh, and uh, you know, there are secrets, as it were. There's also a song which is an insistent, astonishing song that goes on and on all day, all day long. They sing all the time. There is this whole feeling of of uh, the, the people take it very seriously. That, that it is not something that is the children are not allowed to, to to send it up. You know, um, it is it is part and parcel of something that is so far in the past and every time every time i think of the, of uh, of us doing that i always think of course of this hobby horse down there in padster well it's 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 part of the truth of the film really that that that, that exists and and by the way there are similar things um going on as, as sort of yearly ceremonies all the way across europe to the caucasus mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, definitely yes. And May the 1st is an extremely significant day in many religions, mm. and not all of them are very pleasant. Notably communism. Yes. <laughs> of course, since the This is Stair's uh, estate, of course, isn't it? Uh, it is, yes. 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 Mm. Since the release of The Wicker Man, there have been an eruption of a number of Wicker Man-inspired ceremonies. There's the Burning Man ceremony in Nevada, which happens now every year, in which they build a huge wicker man. Really? And, and uh, the furthest anyone can trace this back to is not Caesar's Gallic Wars, but is the release of the wicker man, which seems to have <laughs> inspired its own cult. <laughs> the Burning Man people Close deny man. that, but in fact, um, uh, I, I'm sure you're right. There was a, a review of the film in which it, somebody pointed out rather ridiculously that you looked ridiculous wearing a wig. P- presumably, it's com- it's and it's completely correct. Absolutely, you saw that when he was looking in the library. Chalk I think white it's wonderful face. in this sequence that the way um, Edward um, does his dance completely out of out of step with everyone else. <laughs> yes. I had to make sure that I wasn't in step. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, yes. balloon always goes. I made my up as I went. Yes. I made my up as I went. And this, of course, is the real thing. Timing. Yes. <laughs> These swords are the real yes. thing and are done by the experts. But I made, I made up all my movements and dancing. Oh, and I think your dance around. is marvelous. Um, and your gym shoes. <laughs> yes, I wore that on purpose yes. to make it look, you know, bringing a sense of the ridiculous into it for a moment. Now, those um, things are laundry. Um, uh, lift at pinches, aren't they? Yes, pinches yes, lift yes, laundry yes. out of it. Yes, yes. yeah. they, they, they did nip me occasionally, I must yes. say. I remember mm. during the course of this when I turned around, previous to what we're looking at now, and shouted at Edward, who, of course, I thought, well, I, I knew that it wasn't McGregor, but I'm supposed to think that it is, of course. Yes. And um, I'm supposed to think it's Lindsay Camp, but I know perfectly well that it isn't. It's the only time I ever made Tony Shaffer laugh, because I turned round and I said, McGregor, I suppose you were getting drunk at your own bar. Cut some capers, man. Use your bladder. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that Tony actually did laugh a lot, which he wasn't in the habit of doing very, very often. That's true. Somewhat sombre on occasions. Something which really does stand out about this sequence is it does look like 
you're in the middle of summer. And it is worth mentioning here mm. that Harry Waxman November. has obviously done an extraordinary job of lighting it. I mean, it does... I mean, obviously, it's outdoors, but it is shot in a way which makes What's the November light November? look like... I, I don't know how those trees are as green it, as Well, that. those trees are evergreens. Well, they're evergreens. They must be, yes. yes they're evergreens. And, and that's the current bun, the well-known sun. Um, but he did do a very good job of lighting it. Um, and But it, it has to be said that these exteriors, we were incredibly lucky with oh, the weather. We, we should. Oh. The, 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 the most frightening thing that's ever, ever happened to me in, in any film or television thing I've ever done is being carried by oak oh, yes. being carried up oh. the steps he must have been incredibly oh, strong oh god it was a really frightening he made it look very easy well too. I would I was uh, I have to say I was saying you drop me oh you, quite don't you don't worry don't worry sir I'm, I'm not dropping you I said, don't you dare you <laughs> don't you dare. oh god don't because you get wobbled you know oh it was frightening Absolutely frightening. These stones that we're looking at, um, what's the origin of them? We built them. Out of? Oh, I don't know, it's styrofoam or mm. something like that, yes. They were made down at Shepparton and, and brought up. It was in this, well, it was not in this sequence. It was with the, when the girls were dancing out of the flames that Lady Astaire, who looks exactly like the Queen, and who has corgis appeared she's in the middle of it. But she is yeah. a Beau's lamb. Yes, she? yeah, she's a yes. cousin yeah. of the Queen. Mm. And she appeared, and all the girls suddenly looked up from their naked jumping through the flames and saw the monarch standing there with her corgis. <laughs> and I was watching this through a very long lens, and they all, with one accord, rushed to hide themselves behind those various <laughs> pillars. <laughs> They were all in fleshings, weren't they? they were all yes, in I know, but even so, yes, yes, I, I don't think yes, yes. they were expecting to see, it, to see no. Her Majesty. <laughs> <laughs> she did look remarkably like her. Yeah. And the corgis sort of completed the image. Yes. And al although that scene is long past, where did you cast the girls from that are in that fire dancing sequence? Uh, they from... Local? Uh, well, from... from uh, dance school, uh, Dance school, yes. Yeah, um, yes. Scottish Ballet. Yes. Uh, Royal Scottish Ballet. Who was it? Huh? Yeah, and Stuart Hopps, who, is, who did the choreography, uh, is, has been, I don't know if still is, the director of the Royal Scottish Ballet. Yeah. Sorry. It's a wonderful scene, this pictorially. Yes. Yes. It's a magnificent scene, because of the sea, of course, and, uh, and then the smashing of the barrel of the beer, which again is all part of the rite, but it's superbly done. And I look at the lighting on that, it's absolutely wonderful, the silhouette. And the other thing is the froth, <laughs> when this barrel goes down. I really do. It's marvellous because the froth goes just about everywhere. <laughs> yes, and I did that with a real axe. That's not fake. Yes. And I think it was real beer. Well, I think it was. I mean, look at it. <laughs> it's astonishing. Isn't it? And then it floats about the place. Now, Robin, you've said that, that you and Harry Waxman had many um, discussions during the, the course of filming that occasionally you felt that he wasn't entirely, entirely at ease with the material. Would you like to say anything about that? Well, I think that I think that was true. Um, Harry Waxman was one of the great technological cameramen, and he and he was uh, on the film because we assumed originally that the the Wicker Man shot at the end of the film would have to be faked. In other words, it would have to be done by the blue background process, which in those days was the way you superimposed uh, things like the Wicker Man burning, um, and. Uh, uh, he um, was a great expert at that sort of thing. Um, but he wasn't really particularly in sympathy with the script, I don't think. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Um, and, um, and so we did have arguments about things because he wondered why uh, I was putting all these little clues in all the time, which he didn't think the people would necessarily understand. I mean, he very much had his own point of view. He's a very fine cameraman. Yes, this attitude that people wouldn't understand is far too prevalent in the cinema today. People should be able to use what's left of their minds when they watch something. It isn't just entertainment. I, I, but they must follow the story. He was quite an old guy. He was, oh, I've, wasn't he steeped in the ways he'd you, always yes, done I'd it? Made and one, one must thing. remember about Harry was that he was a curmudgeon. Oh, yes. I mean, he really oh, yes. was, oh, he was a he always curmudgeon. Was. He, he, he was, was always was. angry about he something. He always was, yes. Was I, saw him, sort of I only saw him laugh once. I only saw him laugh once. Added to which, I think his attitude to Robin was 
you know, well, what do you know about it? Because, you you know, this is the first movie you've directed. Look how many I've shot. Yes. I, there was a great deal of that to do with it, you know. It didn't stop him from being Harry, you yeah, know, the great Harry Waxman. His, 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 great, his great lighting scene is a Willow's Dance. Yes. Which is lit absolutely beautiful. Yes. Yes. He was one of our top cameramen. Yes. I mean, um, but he, w- he was much more at home with that than, than some of the other stuff. Yeah. This was dangerous too. Gosh, wasn't it, Chris? Work, working on the edge of this cliff. Was and, I mean, you, you had a far worse time of it than I did because you were virtually naked at one point, and it must have been absolutely appalling. Well, for you. Absolutely cold, appalling. We I hope you, right I hope you, edge, you uh, we're notice right I'm wearing the same jacket, although <laughs> this is a slightly newer one uh, as I'm wearing now. And um, this is Borrowhead. This area. Yes. Which now we will move to the Wicker Man moment, but now there is a, a large caravan park there. At the time when you were shooting around there, what was what was there? I don't think anything. Nothing. I, it was just a, a bare um, heathland leading down to the cliffs. It was incredibly cold that day. Oh. The wind was like ice, yeah. and poor Edward being stripped to the waist. Yeah. I don't know how you and stood it. Feet, it was no, frightful it was, for you. It was cold. Yes, I, I got mean, very one... warmed up when I got into the Wicker Man. <laughs> yes, right. But, I mean, there, no, you're quite right. Where we were standing, because of the wind, oh, it wasn't too strong, the wind it was terribly cold. Well, it, where it we were standing, one around, false step, you know. Suddenly this gust would come round the corner of oh, the rock, yes, you oh, know. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you were oh, standing yes. in the wrong place. Oh, yes. Edward, Ingrid Pitt remembers that you warmed your feet up by putting them on her knees. Yes, I did. In fact, I put them between her legs, I remember. Um, quite low. I mean, yes, know, no, no, sure. It, uh, it I'm not sure we should go further with this conversation. <laughs> no, no, well, she suggested it. She said, you know, I mean, they were blue. They were blue. So, yes, I did. And uh, it was a great relief, I must say. But the trouble is, it was awfully difficult to walk with my legs between <laughs> Ingrid. Now, also during this sequence, you. You fractured your foot, correct? Well, you see, that's another. That's another little that the nurse says no. Um, uh, all I know is I remember. Getting, well, she she said it was, she, it, it was a very bad bruise. Um, all I know is that I I was so cold and uh, I was barefoot and being sort of half dragged. And when I woke up in the morning and put my foot out, it was it was sore. And when I put my foot down, my foot gave way. I you know I could so. She had to, um, she came, I remember, and she bound it you know, very, very tightly, bound it very, very, very tightly, and sort of, again, uh, um, uh, it was a sort of flesh-coloured stuff, you know, and, and Robin didn't, didn't concentrate particularly on the feet. <laughs> but it was, it, was, uh, it was unbelievably painful. But there again, you see, it stopped being painful when you got out into the cold. You see, the, another, no another clue... <laughs> Another clue, I mean, if any more clues were necessary at this stage, is when they all reverence him and take off their masks and bow to him mm. before this happens. It's and chilling, I must... this, you know, it's absolutely chilling. Everybody who's ever seen this film has always said to me, that from now to the very <laughs> end, it is one of the most horrifying things they've ever seen. And I've said, yes, indeed, it is horrifying in, in the best sense of the word. And it's intended to be. And I've also always said it's the only logical conclusion to the story. Yes. There could not be any Nobody other believes ending. Nobody that it's going to happen the way it happens. You know, Until you go no, over the brow yeah, of the hill and you say, oh, Christ, oh, Jesus Christ, mm, mm. which is not an oath from you. Mm. Uh, it, it, is, it is a Christian call for help. Yes, yes. Now, Ingrid Pitt also remembered that um, at some point Anthony Schaffer, sort of at the 11th hour, worried that the ending might be too bleak and that he might have, maybe it was the wrong way to finish. You know, you say it was the only way of finishing it. Do any of you, any else of you remember him having any doubts about it or was this always the way The Wicker Man was going to finish? I never always. heard him expressing it. I, I, I have no knowledge of any other possible suggested ending at any time. And what about the story that when it was first seen by the British Lion um, uh, advertising department, that they were completely flummoxed by the ending and couldn't believe that the film was ending in the way that it did? Well, because they've got no imagination. Well, the, the, uh, the British Lion um, sales force, um, after the film was um, shown to them, uh, filed out in silence. And I was told that they absolutely hated it. Well, total incomprehension. And uh, they said, um, uh, do you expect us to sell this film? I mean, you know, it's got a 
this terrible ending. And uh, I'm afraid that was their reaction. And uh, Anthony Schaffer said that they said to him, is this how it ends? And he said, yes. And they said, well, you can't end like this. And he said, well, it's been in the script for the last eight months. Did you not bother to read it? I think the answer would be no. <laughs> One like, of them did suggest that um, it could, you know, scenes could have been shot where the, it, it came to rain and that and that the that the wicker man fire <laughs> came out as a sort of act of God and and you know then we could have had a sequel with <laughs> yes anyway no one took any of that even, even I've read the sequel even, even Dealey uh, and Spikings didn't buy that there was a sequel written by Anthony Schaffer yep, wasn't I've there? got it. And and what happened? I mean, it, I'm not going to go into that. No, it's I'm not going. No, don't. Call no, the we, loathly not, no. worm. We can't. Don't let's go into that. It would confuse people much too much. <laughs> it confused me when I read yeah, it. Yeah, totally. But it is worth saying, just as a tantalizer, that Howie is in it alive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 He is. Mm. But we're all a great deal older. Yes. Which, in my case, wouldn't be a problem at all. Not right like now. Even the director was a great deal older. <laughs> and now as we start to move towards the, the revelation of the Wicker Man let's just say something about the creation of that edifice Seamus Flannery was the person who there's Paul Giovanni mm. to the left yes now where's Tony he's well, I don't think, somewhere I don't think Tony's had it aware oh, well, he was in there I know that when they started humming well, I can't see him well I, I can remember a very brief flash of him Seamus said, sorry. Uh, Seamus was the person who physically designed the Wicker Man that we have now. Mm. Without, you know, without the face, famously originally, there was the thought of having a face with flowers in the eyes, and then we ended up with the headless figure. What do you all remember about seeing the designs and seeing the Well, thing uh, as a director, I gave him a drawing and some... and some Because um, I do a storyboard of the entire film. Mm. Um, and um, I gave him some references. Um, you know, that... Uh, the, 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 they were really Victorian drawings of what Julius Caesar saw when he first came over in 55 BC. And um, and he then elaborated on that, and uh, he played with various versions of the face. And I think he came up with a very happy solution. I mean, happy is perhaps not the right word, but <laughs> very effective solution um, in, um, in really blanking out the face, because he played with having eyes and yeah. nose and that sort of thing. And I think he, he, what he finally gave us was is marvelous. But in the illustration from that 17th century edition of Caesar's Gallic Wars, it's a it's a wicker man which is absolutely packed with people. There's like about 20 mm. people in it, and yes. it has almost a, a human head atop it, yes, isn't it? Yes, it's a much yes. more yes, with a beard and things like that. But that's how the druids um, murdered is now the word for it, or sacrificed perhaps. So we come. Can I just point out? Yeah. This is the first time I'd ever seen the Wicker Man. And you say, oh, I deliberately Christ, oh, did Jesus not Christ. see the Wicker Man. Yes. It's a terrifying it. looking figure. Mm. It really is. I saw is. one little bit of a drawing and I thought, I'm not, I mustn't see this. I, I hadn't seen so it. So I either. didn't actually see it until I came over that way. I, I, I hadn't know. either. And how tall was it? I don't know. It, it seemed to me to be a thousand feet. I don't know how tall it was. Do you remember? I think it was about 35 feet high. <coughs> oh, I think so, yes. And the tree that they've just walked past was not a natural growing tree there, was it? No. no. Well, you see, this is all golden bough stuff. I mean, um, the, the, the tree um, represents, and had, we had to have a tree there, represents um, the goddess Hera. Um, and it should... Uh, should be there because um, he she's the goddess who presides over the wicker man and uh, for our pagan friends who we mustn't mustn't ignore um, it, this perhaps should have been in a forest but the fact that the tree is there um, is necessary that's the the Scotsman who famously didn't drop you Edward Yes, that's right. Me, yes. But there are two uh, points also which are extremely interesting here. Uh, one, of course, is, well, the incantation, if you like. The animals that you see, of course, naturally, well, touched. Uh, we, people cut round them. I mean, nobody, nobody was burned or singed or injured or anything like that. And the other thing is, well, the awakey heathens and howl, I think you've just said, but the 
other thing was that um, the song we sing, Somebody Is Coming In, is, I believe, the oldest song uh, that we possess in, <laughs> in, the, in the Anglo-Saxon or even English language. Ludi sing cuckoo, it is, isn't mm. it? By something like that. And they sing it with joy, you okay. see. And what is the truth or otherwise of Watch the story the that you're... Watch re- the eyes. Uh, the, the previous... Ch- the, 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 the eyes go to the biggest <laughs> bloody crib board. <laughs> Basically. Oh, really? Yeah. <coughs> hanging on the cliff. Really? Yeah, I uh, dotted it around, and uh, I never basically because that. well, what happened was, if if you remember, we, we, we this was one of the the, the 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 scenes where we had to get the right weather. Yes. And we were getting, you know, we were getting this is the time when the weather was getting, you know, yes, quite yes. bad. Right at the end of the And shoot. so it, it was not shot on the day, uh, you know, uh, uh, per call. It was shot earlier. I had only broken the back of it, so I hadn't actually got down to learning. Hard and fast, you see. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to go and say, "Well, I don't know it yet." So um, the uh, the um, the prop team and myself got this whole thing together, and uh, for the, the centre of the piece, the centre of the speech, it's on two rock faces, <laughs> but on one rock face and on a piece of promontory on the hill. I think in his strange way, Howie, of course, fears death, naturally, a terrible death like this. But there is a point when he's praying later when I think he almost accepts the death of a martyr. Oh, yes, yes. Because to him, yes, this yes. is the salvation, the ultimate salvation yes. of his soul. And uh, yes. someone I has already said, you will sit with the saints among the elect. Yes. And although at the time, of course, he doesn't agree, the point does come now when he starts to pray. I think well, he does accept martyrdom. The speech we gave him, which is um, uh, Terry's um, actually rather last minute um, addition to the script, is the speech that Sir Walter Raleigh made before he went to the block. I really? didn't know that. Yes, that's the actual speech. I didn't know that. The one you're making now. Gosh, you learn a little. Oh, I didn't years, know that I just either. Learned that. This was because I die unshriven, you know. All yes, that. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, oh yes, yes. Now that that because we that uh, this was a piece we really had lots of conversations about what you should actually say in there because um, mm. there were it was a very difficult scene to write really. Yes, it must have been actually. Um, yes. And uh, but I think it's just right. I mean, just mm. correct. You know, uh, what he decided in the end. From a technical point of view as well, we see one Wicker Man, but there are in fact two. There's one up on the cliff head and Burrowhead and one about 100 yards away down to the left, which is slightly lower so that you could get there, the, wasn't it? the and final shot. And there was a torso. Shot. Yeah, the torso. Of yeah. course, the, the final shot is just I think it's the best final shot I've ever seen in any movie. Oh, it's ever. just incredible. Well, you see, that final shot was well, what we thought we'd have to fake. Because, yeah, yeah, yes, because, because we never thought we'd get this with the sun, actually. Yeah. Um, going down and to this scene. It's incredible. And, um, I mean, we must have saved a fortune by that being for real. That was absolutely yeah. It is incredible. I mean, yeah. now that would be CGI. Now, but was this second unit? Yes. Yes. Second unit was marvellous. Oh, to Me and Peter Orwek. I mean, it was just fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't I have made the film today. without him, actually. Just to, to bring this to a close, having now sat through the, that version, which is... 99 minutes long, at PAL, slightly shorter, 96, because of speeding, which is called the 102-minute version. Robin, are you happy with that as the director's cut, that being the longest existent version? I don't think you would find a director in the world who wouldn't be happy with the longest cut. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, I am happy. And, Christopher, you you still feel that there is more... I do feel this film could have held another 10 minutes where the other characters would have been more developed. And some of my dialogue at the very beginning, when Harry and I meet for the first time, because it's so witty and so beautifully written. Edward, your feeling that's complete or that it needs additions? I think it's absolutely dead right. It was such an important part of my life and such an important time for me. 
that I look back on it with such joy and with the people that I was with. Well, we all do. We've got as near as damn it the director's cut, and that's, uh, that's what we have. We have a very we remarkable do. film, which is one of the best British films ever made. Well, uh, Christopher Lee, Robin Hardy, Edward Woodward, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>